I'm going to tell you two stories today, uh, but before I, uh, I, I tell you those two stories, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> My life has gotten really weird in the last about 12 months, I guess. Um, after coming to define myself as someone who was really struggling to be a working actor, I suddenly became a working actor. <laughs> and the amount of time that I spent as a writer and the amount of time that I spent as an actor have kind of inverted. And I am behind on all my writing projects. I was going through my blog trying to find an amusing story to read and I was like, oh, YouTube video, YouTube video, conversation with the dog, YouTube video. There's <laughs> nothing that I can do because I've been really busy. And most of the projects that I've been working on are things that um, are, are secret that I can't really talk about. So I've had this sort of um, emptiness of uh, material that I've been able to, uh, to create. Um, there's this weird thing that happens when, when you're a working actor. Um, you have these development meetings, and, um, and by you I mean me. I have these development meetings. So I, I have been asked uh, frequently in, in about the last year to go to tall glass buildings, to sit in offices and have meetings with people who are interested in developing programming specifically to include me in it. It's the weirdest thing in the world. And it's, you don't have to, I, thank you, but that's not why I'm, I'm, that's not why I said that. It's just, it's just weird, you know, because I'd gotten so used to this experience as an actor of working really hard to prepare like this much material and then going in and finding out we're really only gonna read this much material today and we're not interested in you actually being here. So. About 10 months ago, I had a development meeting, and it was awesome. Like this, uh, a network said, we, listen, we really want to talk to you about, about doing a show with us. And I said, okay, that sounds awesome. And I went down to their tall glass building, and I had a meeting that I expected would last about 20 minutes. It went closer to 90 minutes, because it was an enthusiastic, wonderful meeting. And the, when the meeting was over, the, the person I met with said, now listen, uh, it's, this is a really early stage kind of meeting. It's gonna be a very long time before you hear anything from us. I mean, it, it, it's probably going to be like six or maybe eight months. So there's this thing that happens in the entertainment industry. It happens all the time. Um, you have a meeting, and by you I mean me. I have a meeting. <laughs> I have an audition. I, I, I get a call that says, we want you to come in and read for this part and prepare things. And then generally as I'm on my way out the door, I get another phone call that says, actually, we've changed the role. You don't need to come in now. Uh, and this just happened to me recently. A friend of mine is directing a TV show. And he uh, asked for me to, to send some tape because he wanted to cast me in this particular role. And uh, I, was, I said, well, that, that's great. I would love to do that. So I did all of the things. And um, about five days after... Uh, I sent in the material, he uh, texted me and he said, yeah, so they've actually changed the character. It, it, it's sort of, now the character's kind of like a short, bald guy with um, mommy issues. <laughs> and I replied back, well, I can, I could totally be that, you know, I can, well, thank you for thinking of me. <laughs> so what happens frequently is uh, it has nothing to do Getting a job has very little to do with, with me as an actor, and it has to do with all, these other, uh, all of these other circumstances. So I, I, got a, uh, I got, actually got an email from, from my manager, which is weird because I've been doing this long enough to remember when we talked on the phone for things. I was just talking uh, backstage. Have you ever been doing something on your phone, you know, playing a game or reading Twitter, and it rings and just scares you? <laughs> like, what the hell is that? So uh, I, I got this email from my manager, and he said, so I just wanted to let you know, I talked to this person at the network, and they love you. They think, they, they are, they think you're fantastic, and um, uh, they really want to find something to do with you, but it's not going to be this particular show, because they've decided to go a different way. And, uh, and I said, oh, all right. Um, do we know which way they decided to go? And he said, yes, they've actually decided uh, to develop this show for Tori Spelling.
And I, I just emailed back, WTF? <laughs> and then the phone rang. And it was my manager, and he said, are you, are you, are you upset? You know? And I said, well, I'm upset for television. <laughs> Now I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> I used to write a weekly column for the LA Weekly, our uh, local alternative paper in Los Angeles. And at the same time that I was writing column for the LA Weekly, I was also um, a columnist for the Suicide Girls Newswire uh, on the internet. And um, one week, two things happened that overlapped. And yeah, I, I decided that I would turn these two things into two separate columns that were connected to one another. Uh, one I wrote for my column at the LA Daily at LA Weekly, and the other one I wrote for my uh, for my column at Suicide Girls. Um, and these are they're they're not from any books or anything. They're just stories that I that I like, and I wanted to do something different today that I haven't done before because um, I'm starting to feel like I'm just going to concerts and playing Freebird and not really playing any of the other songs. <laughs> So, uh, um, so this is either going to be cool because you've never get, uh, because you've never heard it before, or it's going to be like when you go to see that band that you like, and they go, "All right, now we're going to play some of our new stuff." <laughs> Come on, Boston, we don't want to hear the new stuff. <laughs> so uh, this is this is a story. Um, these are two stories uh, about the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. The first one is titled, Have You Played Atari Today? About 12 years ago, my wife and I pulled her original Atari 2600 out of storage and hooked it up to our television. We set it on the floor next to my Sega Genesis. <laughs> so now everyone has a classic gaming reference that they can relate to. <laughs> and we showed it to our kids. What's that? One of them asked. This is how we started playing video games at home when we were kids, I said. Yeah, your uncle and I got this for Christmas in 1977, my wife said. And you guys are old, <laughs> said our son Nolan, who was five at the time. We are totally old, I said. Not knowing that 10 years later, he and I would have to stop playing Frisbee in front of our house because I had hurt my old when I tripped over the curb trying to catch up with one of his more powerful throws. We all looked at it together. Once shiny silver switches jutted from the top of a sleek black body that was wrapped in faux wood grain. <laughs> faux wood grain was uh, everywhere in the 70s. <laughs> faux wood grain and airbrushing. Black rubber cords snaked around it ending in the iconic joystick controllers that are woven tightly into the fabric of my youth. A cardboard box, its edges revealing the passage of time as clearly as its contents, sat on the floor beside it. Inside, 20 game cartridges waited, keys to a time machine. Combat, pitfall, yeah. Yar's revenge, yeah. space invaders, Centipede, <laughs> Missile Command, <laughs> Cosmic Arc. Not a lot of people remember Cosmic Arc, it's okay. <laughs> I should probably rewrite this so I don't end with that one. <laughs> I put what? I, I, okay. I pulled Combat out of the box, blew into it, Gently pressed it into the appropriate slot, just like I had hundreds, possibly thousands of times between 1979 and 1985. I felt a surge of excitement well up inside of me as I turned on the television and slid a tiny black switch from TV to game. <laughs> I should have predicted the response that I got from my kids. They grew up in a world where the genesis was state of the art, and my original Game Boy was totally lame because it wasn't in color. <laughs> That's it, Ryan said. He looked at the screen as it cycled through colors that even in the 1970s weren't exactly attractive. <laughs> I flashed what I hoped was an enigmatic smile at him, 
as I dramatically prepared to blow his seven-year-old mind. <laughs> I held a joystick in one hand, enjoying the familiarity as it settled into the other. I grabbed the game reset switch and gently pulled it down. The familiar sound of tank engines rumbled into life, and I was shot through time to the shag-carpeted living room of the house I grew up in, playing against my younger brother on our black-and-white television set. I prepared myself for a trip through the nostalgia wormhole, but before I could get swept away by the wave, I was jarred back into the present by the equally familiar sound of a tank firing its cannon and blasting its opponent. I looked at the screen and saw my tank spinning against the wall. <laughs> I looked to my right and saw that my son Nolan had picked up one of the controllers and was grinning. <laughs> okay, I said. So you push up to, he shot me again. <laughs> While my tank spun around, he began to giggle. Okay, all right, okay, now look, let's give me a chance to, he shot me a third time. <laughs> okay, okay, it's on. <laughs> For the next half hour or so, we blasted each other in all the permutations of tank combat, from an empty field with straight shots to my personal favorite, invisible tank pong with maximum walls. <laughs> we tried airplane combat, but my kids quickly grew tired of that variation just as fast as I did when I was slightly older than they were. When we finished playing combat, we moved on to some of the other games in the box. Without any assistance from me, both of my kids figured out Missile Command, Space Invaders, Air Sea Battle, they even grokked Pitfall. In fact, the only game that gave them any real trouble was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that's a game that I don't think I ever beat when I was a kid. And one of the few Atari 2600 titles which I recall needing the manual to even begin understanding. <laughs> Thankfully for us all, the nearest copy of E.T. was in a landfill somewhere in Arizona. <laughs> where it belonged. the next several weeks, my wife and I noticed that the small video game time budget that we gave the kids was invested almost exclusively into the Atari games, while the state-of-the-art Sega Genesis sat unused in a cabinet beneath our television. Why do you think the kids are playing Atari so much? I asked my wife one night after they'd gone to bed. I mean, you know, besides it being awesome. <laughs> I think the simplicity of the whole thing makes the games more accessible to them, she said. Remember when we were kids how we used our imagination to add details to the games? Remember how easy it was to just start playing and figure it out in just a couple of minutes? I think they're doing the same thing. I agreed with her. The 2600 with its simple eight direction joystick and eight bit graphics was easy for our kids, then ages five and seven, to pick up and start playing immediately. After a while, it couldn't compete with the console systems their friends had, and they gradually lost interest. We kept the 2600 in the house, though, long enough for me to rack up high scores on Pitfall that I never would have been able to achieve when I was 10. <laughs> and I'm sad to report that if you take a picture of yourself in front of the screen with your high score and mail it to the address on the manual, it comes back unopened. <laughs> Turns out we can't send mail through time yet. I'm working on it. I lost my place. Uh, <laughs> we kept the 2600 in the house, though, um, long enough for me to rack up. Remember when I said that? Um, high scores on Pitfall. Remember when we did that? Remember that? Wasn't that great? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, and, and long enough for, for my wife, Anne, to eliminate any doubts about her ability to utterly destroy anyone who is foolish enough to challenge her in air-sea battle. Eventually, we put the Atari 2600 back into the garage, where it remains to this day, on a shelf next to an Atari 800 and a TI-99-4A. I keep them because understanding our past is fundamental to understanding our... Who am I kidding? I kept them because I love them, and that is all the reason I need. So that was published on, uh, on the LA Weekly's uh, site. And um, uh, uh, parenthetically, we pulled that Atari 2600 out of the garage for my wife's 40th birthday party uh, last August. 
Um, we were having an 80s themed party. If you look at my Flickr stream, you can see a picture of the two of us um, in front of this great uh, 80s backdrop that Anne made out of construction paper and, and uh, it, it looks kind of, it's very Nagel-esque. And uh, uh, I, I went to this costume party as a, a one of the um, Tri-Lambs from Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> it was really a stretch for me to do that. And she went dressed up as uh, Madonna from the Lucky Star video. And there's this picture of the two of us, and it just looks like two people who would never be on a date uh, together ever in the 80s, uh, unless there was like a financial transaction involved. <laughs> so I published that on, on, the, on the LA Daily, and then ran this uh, companion piece with it um, over, over at Suicide Girls. Um, uh, the, other, the other piece, which ran like two days later, is called, Yes, as a matter of fact, I have played Atari today. And a little backstory on this. I was uh, supposed to go to a convention up in uh, Michigan called PenguaCon. And one of the things that I was planning to do at this con was play a uh, combat tournament against Sean Powers, who's the editor of Linux Journal. Uh, I got really, really sick uh, like two days before PenguaCon, and my doctor said, you can't fly. Uh, so I wasn't able to go to PenguinCon. A lot of people who attend PenguinCon hate my guts uh, because it's, it's uh, more than once that I've planned to go to this con and uh, was unable to go for one reason or another at really, really close to the last minute. In fact, at this year's PenguinCon, they were uh, handing out either uh, pins or ribbons or something that said, I am not Will Wheaton. <laughs> so um, in order to prepare for my, uh, my, my tournament with Sean, I got one of those Atari flashbacks and uh, uh, I went and picked it up from, uh, from, the, uh, from the post office. And uh, that's where we, this story uh, picks up. So I picked up the Atari uh, flashback from my mailbox. I gently put it into my trunk. And I drove home safely and calmly, respecting all traffic laws and my fellow drivers. Once in the house, I unleashed my inner eight-year-old and I tore the box open with reckless abandon. I grabbed the power supply and jammed it into the wall. I connected it to our television and dove into adventure and then dodge them and then Yar's Revenge. I may have thrown some late 70s album rock onto my Sonos to complete the experience. <laughs> so it's great that you're having so much fun, my son said from the other side of the room while I was cheering the successful introduction of my Zorlon cannon to the Kotile's bitch face. <laughs> But I'm kind of working on my senior project here. He was a senior in high school when this happened. I toned down my celebration. Sorry. I switched to asteroids. And after clearing two screens, I swear I could feel the chlorine in my lungs and, and on my skin from any given day in the summer of 1982. Hey, do you remember when you guys used to play your mom's 2600? I said. I let one small rock drift across the screen while I racked up points blasting flying saucers. He sighed and turned around in his chair. Sort of, I guess, this is a really important project. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, okay, I'm sorry. I'll get out of here, but will, will you play with me when you're done? I, um, I kind of need to practice. He cocked an eyebrow. You need to practice? Playing Atari? What? <laughs> it's for this thing at the end of the month. I'm playing combat at a convention. You are so weird. <laughs> I know. So will you play with me? OK. Our roles thoroughly reversed. He returned to his work, and I went back to my office. A while later, he called out to me, OK, I'm done. I stood up carefully. I slowly pushed the chair beneath my desk. I walked carefully through the house and did not scare my dog when I nearly tripped over her near the aquarium in the living room. I did not nearly stub my toe on the dining room table, and I was not out of breath and flush with excitement when I finally met Nolan in the family room. Just in case anyone was wondering how that all went down. We turned on the television, and a few minutes later, we faced off in tank pong with maximum walls. It was a furious battle, ending in a 7-7 tie when my last second shot found its mark. Again, he said. I bumped the reset button and quickly build and built an eight to three lead. Nolan never caught up. Two out of three, I said. He made a face that was a combination of amusement and determination. 
Yes. He built a 10 to 2 lead almost instantly. I spent more time spinning around than I did actually driving my tank, though I managed to traverse the entirety of the map. I think there's a problem with this game, he said, as the match ended 11 to 6. It's way too easy to just chain your attacks together and completely own the other player. I think that's part of it, though, I said, starting a new game. You've just got to find a way to keep moving and get in that first shot. He got in the first shot. <laughs> and the next shot. And the shot after that. And the next five shots. I got in a couple of shots of my own, but it wasn't enough. I realized too late that I was probably struggling because I'd forgotten um, to play that song from the end of Karate Kid in my head <laughs> as inspirational music. <laughs> You're the undisputed master of combat, I said when we were done. As your reward, you get to watch me play adventure. I flipped switches and was soon on my way to collect the various items required to complete my quest. What's that? Oh, that? That's my sword, I said, pushing my little box against an arrow-shaped icon. Uh, what do you, what do you use it for? Slaying dragons? I entered a once simple maze of corridors that the passage of time had made as vexing as it was when I was eight. You realize you've gone into that dead end five times, right? <laughs> Shh. This is how we did it back in the 80s. You ran into the same dead end over and over again? Yeah, it was part of Reaganomics. <laughs> I finally found my way out of the maze, and I approached a castle, anxious to impress Nolan by grabbing the glowing gold chalice within. That's when the dragon showed up. What the hell is that? Well, it's a dragon, of course, I said, holding the joystick out in front of me like I always did, convinced that if I moved it around as I tried to evade the dragon, it would help me escape faster. That's when the dragon ate me. Wait, so... You guys did this for fun? <laughs> well, there was this, and, and we would occasionally fend off uh, Indian attacks when we were dinosaurizing our caves, yes. He laughed. Uh, what other games are on this? I showed him Yara's Revenge. This was my favorite Atari 2600 game when I was a kid. I liked this game even more than Pitfall. He looked at me. I liked Pitfall a lot. He continued to look at me. We all liked Pitfall a lot. Okay, so you're, you're this little insect creature called the Yar, I said as the game began. And this guy over here, he's the Kotile. He destroyed your home planet or something, and you've built this Sorlon cannon to extract your titular revenge. I flew around the screen through the neutral zone, chipped away at the Kotile defenses. My Zorlon cannon activated, and I waited to take my shot. From time to time, though, the Kotile turns into a swirl, and the swirl shoots itself at you. That's when the Kotile turned into a swirl, and I blasted it out of the sky. Yes! I looked at him, waiting to bask in his approval. That's it. Well, you get to fly around this cool screen between the levels, too. Oh, and the second level, it has a rotating shield. Watch. He looked at the flashing graphics on the screen and scratched his chin. How many people got seizures from this when you played it? <laughs> I do not know. I bet you I can destroy it three times without dying, he said. Go, I handed him the joystick. Okay, so I shoot it that thing that looks like a distress signal? That thing is the Kotile. Yes, yes, you shoot at the Kotile with your Zorlon cannon because you are exacting, yeah right, revenge, I got that. I watched with more pride than I thought possible or revealed to my easily embarrassed teenage son as it took him two minutes to do exactly what he said she'd do. He'd do. He'd do. That's going to make sense in a minute. Does this ever get hard, he asked. 
That's what she said. <laughs> he slowly shook his head and handed the joystick back to me. I'm sorry, uh, reflex. Yes, it gets challenging later on. The missile thing moves a lot faster, the swirls fly out a lot faster, and more frequently. But it's pretty much the same two levels over and over again. Uh, the same two awesome levels, yeah. We looked at each other. It came with a comic book. Did I tell you about that? <laughs> you are so weird. <laughs> but I'm also kind of awesome, right? Where were you a year ago? <laughs> you were here. <laughs> you wouldn't fit in my house anyway. Uh, but I'm also kind of awesome, right? He <laughs> I feel like Paul and Stork trying to do the captain's wife's lament. <laughs> that, I am going to regret that. <laughs> but... <laughs> but I'm also kind of awesome, right? I'm really trying to end this so that we can get to the questions part of our time together, but we can, keep, we can be stuck in this wild loop forever if you want. I'm just trying to hit control C and it's not happening. It came with a comic book. Did I tell you about that? You're so weird, but I'm also kind of awesome, right? We looked at each other. Um, I love video games. I really do. Um, I love the worlds that we create when we play them. Um, I love that, though my kids and I uh, don't have as much in common uh, now as they are becoming adults as we did when they were little, um, that we can still share these things, that we can do these things together. Um, I don't understand some of the games they play. I don't, I, I don't get the appeal of the runaround no-scope kill in uh, Call of Duty. Uh, but apparently that's a very big deal to my son. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of awesome when he comes running into my office to describe to me how he's gone through and run an entire team uh, by, by himself. And I can see, like, sort of the pride that he, that he takes in that. My, uh, my other son, his older brother, really loves the narrative video games. And he and I played Bioshock 2 at about the same rate together. I know, isn't that a great game? And uh, now we're playing Red Dead Redemption at about the same rate together. And it's so cool, you know? Uh, I gave the keynote address at Penny Arcade Expo East in Boston earlier this year. Thank you. Um, I, it, was, it was hard to do that. Um, and I, I talked a lot about video games as narrative storytelling devices. And, you know, we have really different tastes in, in television shows. Uh, my kids... Uh, they like Bones and they like House, and I just don't, I don't. Um, sorry, I know, I know you guys love them and that's great. I just don't do anything. I would rather watch Doctor Who. And so we don't really have a lot of television that we can kind of have water cooler talk about, you know? But we can do it about video games. And what's great about video games is that each time we play it, especially when it's a narrative game, if we're playing different styles of characters, different things happen in the game. And we have this, this like kind of uh, time-shifted, non-linear shared world that we can both, ex you know, the, all three of us can exist in at different times. And it gives us this wonderful thing to have in common. It gives us an excuse to talk to each other. And as I have noticed as a parent of teenagers, one of the most important things we need are excuses to talk to our kids and relate to them and stay involved in their lives at that time where they're kind of like, oh my God, you're my parent, you're so lame. And... Um, I, I, I make this point every time I get an opportunity to speak in public. Video games matter, video games are important, and um, video games are, are, are here to stay. And I, I would love it very much if the people who need to find the current satanic panic um, would just sort of like lay off of the video games. Um, because they are, they, they are a very positive and good part of our lives.